Government Obligations In addition to what the government currently spends, it has various legal obligations to make future expenditures. These obligations are specified and quantified in the case of government bonds that must be redeemed for various amounts of money at, fu at various future dates. Other obligations are open-ended, such as legal obligations to pay whoever qualifies for unemployment compensation or agricultural subsidies in the future. These obligations are not only open-ended, but difficult to estimate, since they depend on things beyond the government's control, such as the level of unemployment and the size of farmers' crops. Other open-ended obligations that are difficult to estimate are government guarantees of loans made by others to private borrowers or guarantees to those who lend to foreign governments. These guarantees appear to cost nothing so long as the loans are repaid, and the fact that these guarantees cost the taxpayers nothing is likely to be trumpeted in the media by advocates of such guarantees who can point out how businesses and jobs were saved without any expense to the government. But, at unpredictable times, the loans do not get paid, and then huge amounts of the taxpayers' money get spent to cover one of these supposedly costless guarantees. When the U.S. government guaranteed the depositors in savings and loan associations that their deposits would be covered by government insurance, this appeared to cost nothing until these savings and loan associations ran up losses of more than $500 billion. The kind of costs incurred in fighting a war for several years, and their depositors were reimbursed by the federal government after these enterprises collapsed. Among the largest obligations of many governments are pensions that have been promised to future retirees. These are more predictable, given the size of the aging population and their mortality rates. But the problem here is that very often, there is not enough money put aside to cover the promised pensions. This problem is not peculiar to any given country, but is widespread among countries around the world since elected officials everywhere benefit at the polls by promising pensions to people who vote, but stand to lose votes by raising tax rates high enough to pay what it would, uh, but stand to lose votes by raising tax rates high enough to pay what it would cost to redeem those promises. It is easier to leave it to future government officials to figure out how to deal with the later financial shortfall when the time comes to actually pay the promised pensions. The difference between political incentives and economic incentives is shown by the difference between government-provided pensions and annuities provided by insurance companies. Government programs may be analog analogized to... Analogized to the activities of insurance companies by referring to these programs as social insurance, but without, in fact, having either the same incentives, the same legal obligations, or the same results as private insurance companies selling annuities. The most fundamental difference between private annuities and government pensions is that the former create real wealth by investing premiums, while the latter create no real wealth, but simply use current premiums from the working population to pay current pensions to the retired population. What this means is that a private annuity invests the premiums that come in, creating factories, apartment buildings, or other tangible assets whose earnings will later enable the annuities to be paid to those whose money was used to create these assets. But government pension plans, such as Social Security in the United States, simply spend the premiums as they are received. Much of this money is used to pay pensions to current retirees, but the rest of the money can be used to finance other government activities, ranging from fighting wars to paying for congressional junkets. There is no wealth created in this process to be used in the future to pay the pensions of those who are currently paying into the system. On the contrary, part of the wealth paid into these systems by current workers is siphoned off to finance whatever other government spending Congress may choose. The illusion of investment is maintained by giving the Social Security Trust Fund government bonds in exchange for the money that is taken from it and spent on other government programs. But these bonds likewise represent no tangible assets, 
They are simply promises to pay money collected from future taxpayers. The country as a whole is not one dollar richer because these bonds were printed, so there is no analogy with private investments that create tangible wealth. If there were no such bonds, then future taxpayers would still have to make up the difference when future Social Security premiums are insufficient to pay pensions to future retirees. That is exactly the same as what will have to happen when there are bonds. Accounting procedures may make it seem like there is an investment when the social security system holds government bonds, but the economic reality is that neither the government nor anyone else can spend and save the same money. What has enabled social security and similar government pension plans in other countries to postpone the day of reckoning is that a relatively small generation in the 1930s was followed by a much larger baby boom generation of the 1940s and 50s. Because the baby boom generation earned much higher incomes and therefore paid much larger premiums into the social security system, the pensions promised to the retirees from the previous generation could easily be paid. Not only could the promises made to the 1930s generation be kept, additional benefits could be voted for them, with obvious political advantages to those awarding these additional benefits. With the passage of time, however, a declining birth rate and an increasing life expectancy reduced the ratio of people paying into the system to people receiving money from the system. Unlike a private annuity, where premiums paid by each generation create the wealth that will later pay for its own pensions, government pensions pay the pensions of the retired generation from the premiums paid by the currently working generation. That is why private annuities are not jeopardized by the changing demographic makeup of the population, but government pension plans are. Government pension plans enable current politicians to make promises which future, gener which future governments will be expected to keep. These are virtually ideal political conditions for producing generous pension benefits and future financial crises resulting from those generous benefits. Nor are such incentives and results confined to the United States. Countries of the European Union likewise face huge financial liabilities as the size of their retired populations continues to grow, not only absolutely, but also relative to the size of the working populations whose taxes are paying their pensions. Moreover, the pensions in European Union countries tend to be more readily available than in the United States. In Italy, for example, working men retire at an average age of 61, and those working in what are defined as arduous occupations, miners, bus drivers, and others, retire at age 57. The cost of this generosity consumes 15% of the country's gross domestic product, and Italy's national debt in 2006 was 107% of the country's GDP. Belatedly, Italy raised the minimum retirement age to 59. As France, Germany, and other European countries began to scale back the generosity of their government pension policies, political protests caused even modest reforms to be postponed or trimmed back. But neither the financial nor the political costs of these government pensions were paid by the generation of politicians who created these policies decades earlier. Local governments operate under much the same set of political incentives as national governments, so it is not surprising that employees of local governments and of enterprises controlled or regulated by local governments often have very generous, generous pensions. Not only may employees of New York's Long Island Railroad, run by the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, retire in their 50s, the vast majority of these retirees also receive disability payments in addition to their pensions, even though most made no disability claims while working, but only after retiring. In 2007, for example, 94% of career employees who retired from the Long Island Ra Railroad after age 50 then received disability benefits, according to the New York Times. Far from reflecting work hazards, these post-retirement disability claims are part of a whole web of arcane work rules under union contracts that permit employees to collect two days' pay for one day's work and permitted one engineer to collect 
five times his base salary one year and later be classified as disabled after retirement, according to the New York Times. In Brazil, government pensions are already paying out more money than they are taking in, with the deficits being especially large in the pensions for unionized government employees. In other words, the looming financial crisis which American and European governments are dreading and trying to forestall has already struck in Brazil, whose government pensions have been described as the most generous in the world. According to The Economist, Civil servants do not merely retire on full salary. They get, in effect, a pay rise because they stop paying contributions into the system. Most women retire from government service at around 50, and men soon afterwards. A soldier's widow inherits his pension and bequeaths it to her daughters. Given that Brazil's civil servants are an organized and unionized special interest group, such generosity is understandable politically. The question is whether the voting public in Brazil and elsewhere will understand the economic consequences well enough to be able to, to avoid the financial crises to which such unfunded generosity can lead, in the name of social insurance. Such awareness is beginning to dawn on people in some countries. In New Zealand, for example, a poll found that 70% of New Zealanders under the age of 45 believe that the pensions they have been promised will not be there for them when they retire. In one way or another, the day of reckoning seems to be approaching in many countries for programs described as social insurance, but which were in fact never insurance at all. Such programs not only fail to create wealth, the more generous retirement plans may in fact lessen the rate at which wealth is created by enabling people to retire while they are still quite capable of working and thus adding to the nation's output. For example, while 62% of the people in the 55 to 64 year old bracket in Japan are still working, and 60% in the United States, only 41% of the people in that age bracket are still working in the countries of the European Union. It's not just the age at which people retire that varies from country to country. How much their pensions pay compared to how much they made while working also varies greatly from one country to another. While pensions in the United States pay about 40% of pre-retirement earnings and those in Japan less than 40%, pensions in the Netherlands and Spain pay about 80% and in Greece 96%. No doubt that has something to do with when people choose to stop working. It also has something to do with the financial crisis crises that struck some European Union countries in the early 21st century. While the United States has long lagged behind European industrial nations in government-provided or government-mandated benefits, it has in more recent years been increasing such benefits rapidly. Unemployment insurance benefits, which used to end after 26 weeks in the United States, have been extended to 99 weeks. Other alternatives to working have also increased in their utilization. Disability pay under Social Security insurance, for example. Barely 3 million Americans received work-related disability checks from Social Security in 1990. Sorry, barely 3 million. I don't, know. I don't know if I said billion or million. Barely 3 million Americans received work-related disability checks from Social Security in 1990, a number that had changed only modestly in the preceding decade or two. Since then, the number of people drawing disability checks has soared, passing 5 million by 2000, 6.5 million by 2005, and rising to nearly 8.6 million today.